I'd now like to call upon former Premier of Victoria and Chair of the Anzac Centenary Committee, Ten Bailu, to present our gift of thanks to Associate Professor, Professor Uya on behalf of the Australian Intercultural Society, and then to share his thoughts on the, uh, the presentation. Well done, Messer. Solid gold. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. Can I acknowledge uh, Messet and thank him for his presentation, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, and uh, thank also Amit Keskin and the AIS, and please don't underestimate the great job that the AIS do. Uh, a really important thing uh, for us in multicultural Victoria to ensure that we're not only just connecting our multicultural communities to the centre, but we're connecting them to each other. And that gives us the strongest possible uh, tapestry in our community and I think uh, we are at the front end of multiculturalism here in Melbourne and in Victoria and the AIS are doing a great job that, in that regard. can also acknowledge Deacon and all the other dignitaries, and particularly uh, Natalie and uh, Khalid who are here and I think there's some other members of Parliament who are at least due to be here and many others who are here but I also want to particularly acknowledge the students who are here from Sirius and uh, uh, not here. And uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that because I bet in the last 45 minutes you've, your thoughts have wandered from time to time. And that's what happens. And let me give you a couple of little uh, thoughts. Last year, as chairman of the Anzac Centenary Committee, we were talking to a group of year 10s, a couple of hundred of them. And we, uh, we do a pretty engaging presentation. At the end of it, we had two questions. And the first question was, given that we came out for the centenary, why are we bothering with this? which is an understandable question from somebody who's 14 or 15 years old. It's 100 years ago. Why do we bother? And we have to bother because we have to understand our past to understand the future. We have to understand the service and sacrifice in our own culture and community and in the other communities uh, that make up our society in order to understand where we're at and where we're going to be. It's a part of us. And so when we started on this uh, Centenary of Anzac uh, commemoration, and it does go for a number of years, we set ourselves five clear objectives. Firstly, to honour those who served and sacrificed on all sides. Secondly, to educate. And we've all been educated this morning. A little more education doesn't go astray. But the vast majority of Australians have lost a lot of that information. Understand about Anzac Day. But the details, they're lost. Lost in their minds. But they're not lost in our community. And thirdly, we said we had to pass the torch to the next generation. I'm nearly 900 years old. <laughs> Messer, I think you're, uh, you're nearly 700 years old, something like that. Don't even go there with Don't me. Don't even go there. I'm not going there with Karen, not now. Like, it's the next generation that counts. Winston Churchill said nearly 100 years ago that when Australians look back at these events in 100, 200 and 300 years time, this is Winston Churchill nearly 100 years ago, when Australians look back, they will look back at these events, the people, the places and what took place, and they will seek to make some connection. And that's so important to us, making a connection. So, honour, educate, pass the torch. And in addition to that, we said we had to leave a richer legacy, a richer legacy of information, of relationships, of understanding, and making material accessible. I must talk before about having to go to London to uh, examine records, and there are others here who've had the same experience. We need to bring that online, make it accessible, and a lot of it is now accessible, and I'll show you about that in a moment. And finally, we said, well, we have to do whatever we can to strengthen whatever alliances have come from these events. French friends, coalition partners, enemies at the time. Turkey and Australia are very close now. We have to do whatever we can to strengthen those alliances. Now, in that regard, what the AIS do is critically important. 
And what Masood has uh, done for us today is to better inform us so we get that balanced perspective. And bearing in mind all of that, I just want to read you something that was written in January 1916 by a 29-year-old veteran of Gallipoli, written from Egypt. And he's some lines in a letter home about his uh, views of what happened at Gallipoli. And he said, the evacuation from Anzac was not by any means a defeat, but it became obvious we could do no good there and we were getting hell from the new, bigger Turkish guns. Of course, we left so many poor chaps buried there. Splendid fellows. And it all seems so sad, but we had attempted the impossible at the Dardanelles, and the Turks we now hear are planning to make the evacuation day a special day of national feasting. And he went on, and well they may. They fought well and very fairly, and can make a very good story of their victory. That's an Australian soldier's perspective. And Masood was right. We hear the perspective of the stories that were repeated over and over and over and over every Anzac Day. And students will turn up to the shrine and they'll go to Anzac Day and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll listen, they'll be respectful and they'll honour the oath and sing the anthem. And the next day, it's gone again. What we have to do is understand there are so many, many stories we have to give the students of today and tomorrow a connection to these events which will last them for a lifetime. And Masood showed a, an, a, an extraordinary picture there of the books. And I presume that was an honest depiction, Masood, that, that was, uh, they were all books about the First World War and Gallipoli and that you'd read them all. <laughs> and I don't know how many were in English and how many were in Turkish or in another language. But uh, our first question here, for the students who don't know, uh, the lady who's not a lady is actually uh, an historian in his own right, Hugh Dolan, who's written some amazing stuff about Gallipoli, including a book called 36 Days of Gallipoli, which tells an entirely different story from the story we've been fed about whether uh, Australians landed at the right place or not. From historical information dug out of archives that nobody had bothered to go before, to before, just as Mr. did. There are a million stories, but there are a billion connections. And it's the connections that are powerful. Give a young person a connection to these events and to these people, they'll have it for life. And it will be 200 and 300 years uh, of uh, remembering and respecting. And you can connect in many ways. You can connect by family, of course, but it's hard if you're talking about great-great-grandparents you're up to four, or eight, sixteen family names you've got to deal with, and it's very hard on the Turkish side because the records are diffuse. They're located in villages such as there are records. We are blessed to have centralised and very much online records. You can connect by institutions, schools, churches, sporting clubs. You can connect by occupation, and recently we've had Victoria Police doing just that, honouring the police officers who served as original Anzacs because we can now provide them with that information, and we did. Uh, you can connect by multicultural heritage. And there are obviously students here with a Turkish background, soup with a uh, Turkish background. Our minister, Joanna Aaron, Minister for Veterans Affairs, his grandfather fought at Gallipoli for Turkey, for the Ottoman forces. And you can also connect by location. Now, I'm just going to give you a little example of that. I'm going to be very cheeky. Karen? from the ABC, a beautiful corporation, ABC. I don't know whether you know, Karen, Karen Percy, that amongst the original Anzacs who fought in the First World War, there were 43 who carried the surname Percy. Seven of them were from Victoria. One of them, George Percy, was a 31-year-old in the 6th Battalion, and he lived at 140 Nicholson Street in Carlton. Anybody thinking of driving home down Nicholson Street this afternoon, 
pop down Nicholson Street, you'll see 140 Nicholson Street. I think it's on the corner of what's it Street, and I think it's now a block of flats, but there's a bunch of terrace houses next door. And George fought at Gallipoli, and he was one of the very first to depart from Port Melbourne on the largest ship, the Hororata, in October 1914. As I said, just a 31-year-old, married, wife living in 140 Nicholson Street in Carlton. And you know, at Nicholson Street in Carlton, just the Carlton bit, not the Fitzroy bit, just the Carlton bit, there were 85 other boys who were original Anzacs from Nicholson Street Carlton, including 136 Nicholson Street Carlton, which I think is still one of those terrace houses. Now, I've got no idea, Carol, whether that person is related to any member of your family, but just seven Percy's from Victoria. Now, George survived the Gallipoli campaign, but I'm just sitting here doing this little bit of research, literally as I was listening to my suit. That's how accessible it now is. And my simple research suggested to me that George was wounded at Gallipoli because he returned to Australia from Egypt and left Egypt in January 1916 at exactly the same time as that letter was being written, the one that I read to you before. And it wasn't George Percy that wrote it. It was written by, uh, as I said, a 29-year-old, who, as it happens, arrived at Gallipoli for the very first time 100 years ago this week. Arrived between the dates of 6th and 9th of September 1915. And on the 9th of September 1915, at Gallipoli, something else happened. And it's been written about by others. On the 9th of September 1915, the troops paused. The Allied troops paused. And some boats came across the water from Lemnos. And on board, for the very first, and as I understand it, the only time, there were a bunch of nurses who came to the front line. And you can imagine the impact that that had on the troops on the 9th of September, 100 years ago today. Probably 100 years ago as we're speaking because it was at dawn of life. And that was what that tended to happen. They tend to arrive at dawn. And uh, the extraordinary thing letter writer from Egypt arrived a hundred years ago this week. His brother had been at Gallipoli for some time and was the senior commander for the Allied forces in the August offensive. When he arrived in Gallipoli he had an eight month old daughter. He survived Gallipoli, he went on and was killed in France. His name was William Knox. His daughter was my mother. It's a thread of connection. It still makes me sure. It's a connection my, I will have for the rest of my life to Turkey, to Gallipoli, to these events, to all the people he served with. And it'll be a connection to the name Percy and to Karen. And I don't know whether it's real, but it does connect us. And that information is all available to us. I've sat there and, and uh, probably uh, um, Ahmed was wondering what I was doing, just on my phone, pulling some of that information out of my phone. And to the kids here, your mind will wander off. But if you help yourself find a thread, you can find by home, you can go to the AIF website, and find, search a location, search a street. You can find a multicultural connection. It'll be with you. Whether it's the story that Masood has told us, the story that Hugh Dolan will tell us, or in any of the other stories. This is real. It's our history. It's not something else. And the people involved were as young as the students here today, many of them. My grandfather arrived at Gallipoli on board a ship that carried a young boy named Jimmy Martin who lived at 43 Mary Street in Portland, just near where I live. 
when he died at Gallipoli, he was 14 years old. We think about this as all 100 years old. It's not. It's ours. It's a rich history. It's faces. It's people. It's real connections. And they're all around us. Grab it at every opportunity. Thank you to the IAS. Thank you to Mr. Extraordinary presentation. And we should hear more of that so we make it all more real. And it's all the more important because 100 years later, in the same part of the world, we're still struggling. Thanks very much.